Hey everyone, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Uh, what follows is my conversation with Dr. Ian McGilchrist, which took place on September 21st, 2022. It was published in the winter issue of Rattle, Rattle number 78. The conversation is a deep dive into the divided brain, exploring the role the two unique hemispheres play in creativity. We also discuss how the modern world has come to be dominated by the left hemisphere's narrow focus and how poetry might be an antidote to the matter with things. Dr. McGilchrist is a psychiatrist, philosopher, and literary scholar. He's a quantum fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and of the Royal Society of Arts, as well as a former director of the Bethlehem Royal Maudsley Hospital, London. His previous book, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, reached international recognition and acclaim and has marked him out as one of the greatest thinkers and philosophers of our time. His latest publication is a two-volume work, The Matter with Things, which was published in 2021 by Perspective of Press. A sustained critique of reductive materialism, it concerns the questions of who we are and what is the world, what do we mean by purpose, value, and the divine, and how do we most reliably set about finding out. You can find much more of Ian McGilchrist's work at channelmcgilchrist.com. That's channel McGilchrist, M-C-G-I-L-C-H-R-I-S-T dot com. He also has a YouTube channel where he posts many videos, including a poem of the day during the pandemic. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this conversation and um, we'll be back next week with the Rattlecast. Take care. But, uh, but let's start. So this is a, like I said, it's just a thrill to be talking to you. Um, just to, uh, to yes, let you know yes. where I'm coming from, I'm kind of a, you know, have a broad range of interests in the same way that you do. Um, I was a molecular biology major as an undergraduate and worked in, in an mRNA lab um, at the University of Rochester studying the, the conformational binding structures of mRNA um, as an undergraduate. And then just a few years later, oh. I ended up being a, a poetry editor by some, you know, the way life works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, um, quite. So maybe in a different direction as you. Um, but, um, but a simpler kind of thing. And, and so I, I came at poetry at first from a scientific kind of curiosity. I wanted to know, like, what made poetry uh -huh. tick. And we had this whole archive yeah. at the magazine of interviews. So I was reading through, we had about 50 interviews at the time. Now it's hundreds. Um, and, I, and reading through, thinking about the ways poets talk about their creative process. And, and to me, I started coming up with, like, this, this model of... of um, um, like the consciousness sort of mining the subconscious for what truths and meaning that the subconscious knows. And so when I came yeah. across uh, The Master and His Emissary, it sort of it provided a neurological grounding for that f belief in how mm. poetry was operating um, and also mm. sort of t tilted it 90 degrees because instead of this, this sort of ephemeral consciousness and subconsciousness distinction, it was really the, the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Um, so to yeah. start out, could you explain just just your model of um, of the two hemispheres um, and their asymmetry and why they're 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 different and the the basis for that, um, just so people that don't aren't familiar with your work can understand what we're talking about later. Sure. Um, by the way, are we actually recording? Because I haven't seen anything saying we are recording. Uh, we are. It's just um, I'm th recording through OBS. So. Oh, okay, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Now, normally, a little thing comes up and says, "Recording has started," and then I go, "Yeah, got it." Uh, <laughs> okay, well, we usually do a live podcast, so I'm um, using the same system as is that, and not not. Zoom okay, or great. Zoom. Yeah. O okay, yeah. Um, how to do this simply? I ought to have got the elevator pitch by now. <laughs> um, I, I think it's it's the. The first thing to say is that most people who think they've heard about the differences between left and right hemispheres need to forget just about everything they've ever heard, because that is wrong. Uh, what is also wrong is that there are no interesting differences. <laughs> um, it, yes, the old version of right versus left hemispheres has been exploded, but no, it's not that there's no differences. There are very, very important differences, more important, actually, than the ones that were mentioned. And the differences are in how, not in what. So in the old days, it was language and reason in the left, emotion and pictures in the right. Now we know that both are involved in absolutely everything, but they just do them in, in predictably, consistently, quite different ways. So the left hemisphere, which from a point of view of evolution is the one that is helping us to grasp and manipulate the environment to get food accurately and swiftly to pick up a twig to build a nest that kind of stuff um, the right hemisphere is seeing the broad 
picture. It has sustained vigilance for everything else, the 360-degree arc, whereas the left hemisphere is focusing on about three degrees of that arc. Now, this gives rise to two different kinds of world based on the two kinds of attention they pay. And I just want to emphasize the word attention because it's pretty important. I didn't initially twig quite how important it is, but it is actually the faculty whereby we constitute the phenomenological world we inhabit. And if you have a very precisely targeted, already preempted attention to a detail, but in, or, or on the other hand, have a completely broad, open, ready-for-anything kind of attention to the whole, you see two different worlds. The left hemisphere sees a world made up of little fragments that are isolated and static. Uh, and its job is to somehow use them or put them together. Um, it, it sees a world in which what it understands has to be explicit, is decontextualized, is abstract and general. And the right hemisphere sees one in which what it sees is always connected with other things, always moving, always changing, always ramifying, never necessarily explicit. It picks up all the stuff that's implicit, which is terribly important, like humour and metaphor and jokes and, and, and poetry and myths. <laughs> um, and it understands that everything needs to be seen in its context, including the context of the body. So it's in touch with that body and with the unique, whereas the left hemisphere is not. The left hemisphere's world is rather like an abstract plan, a theory or a map. Uh, it, it works for certain purposes, strategic purposes, but it's not good at understanding the whole world that it maps. That's the right hemisphere's task. So that's effectively the difference that the world presences as in all its complexity, beauty and fullness and uh, integrity to the right hemisphere. And the world is seen as a skeletal, abstracted, minimalist schema or map of that world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love the way you put it it's simply uh, that the left brain is interested in apprehension and the right brain is interested in comprehension. And, and that seems to yeah. be the, the main distinction. It's just what they're, what they're interested in, really. Um, and, and so why, why would a brain develop such, such strong asymmetry? Um, and, and I think you, you mentioned that the, the corpus callosum in mammals is much thicker than, um, than in other, other animals. Um, and, and so there's like this sense that it has to be divided. Um, what is it that, that, like, what is the benefit of having two minds instead of one? Wouldn't it be simpler if we had just one and, and we knew what we were doing all the time? Yes, well, I mean, the first point to make is that it is literally all pervasive. So every creature we know, however um, primitive from our point of view in the hierarchy of living beings at which we stand on the pinnacle, however low in that they stand. If they have a brain at all, it's divided. And even the first neural networks that we're aware of, there is a, a creature still living, a sea anemone called Nematocella vectensis, has a neural net 700 million years old, it's already asymmetrical. What is this about? It's about solving a conundrum on which survival depends, which is how can I effectively and efficiently grab and get stuff that I need to manipulate and yet at the same time survive? Because if I'm just paying this very narrowly targeted attention, I will become prey to whatever else is going on around me. I won't be aware of predators. I won't even be aware of my own mate, my, my offspring. The whole of the picture will be absent from my mind. Mm -hmm. So this is such a difficult thing to do with one neural network that uh, evolution has made sure that there are two. The corpus callosum is in fact um, a mammalian invention. So there is no uh, connection, direct connection between the hemispheres or only very vestigial ones before you come to the mammalian corpus callosum. There were some commissures, but they, uh, uh, um, several factors, uh, 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 orders of magnitude um, less um, impressive than the corpus callosum. And what's interesting is that over evolution in mammals, the corpus callosum has not kept up with the increase in size in the brain. Mm. So our corpus callosum is relatively small mm. compared with our rather large brains. 
And what's more, a lot of the stuff going on between the hemispheres is actually inhibitory. So uh, what you've got is two neural networks, each capable of attending to the world in a different way, and therefore producing for us experientially two coherent but different pictures of reality, both of which we need to draw on. Neither of them is just right or wrong. In certain circumstances, we need the one. In certain circumstances, the other. But the general idea is that they need to be able to function largely without interfering with one another. And that's why the corpus callosum is actually often saying, you keep out of this, I'm dealing with it. Yeah, and that gets into the creative process that I keep seeing You know, in every poet I interview. They talk about the way that they... you know, all, We all talk about how poems provide something that we didn't know we knew. Um, you know, poets talk about how they feel a scent and they, they have an itch and they just want to scratch it and they're like a bloodhound following a trail, figuring out where it goes. And it really feels like it's that, that left um, focused attention that's trying to explore into the, the deeper understandings of the right brain and sort of make sense of that. Um, th- does that work in your model? Like where, where does creativity come from in this process um, with the, with the holistic understanding of the right versus that focused attention and the language that, that the left has access to. Yes, well, this is the embarrassing moment at which I do accept <laughs> that one of the things that has always been said about hemisphere differences is, on exhaustive examination, likely to be correct, which is that the right hemisphere has a much greater role in creativity than the left. It can do things like hold opposites together without uh, having to collapse them into, is it this or is it that? It therefore is able to understand different layers of meaning that may not immediately cohere to the conscious mind. It can understand, um, metaphor, it can understand, uh, as I say, all the implicit stuff uh, that is necessary for great literature and that doesn't have to be spelled out, and indeed becomes much less powerful when it's spelled out, much as a joke collapses as soon as it's explained. So if the left hemisphere's focal, irritable need for certainty, it loves certainty, whereas the right hemisphere uh, is more able to say, yeah, but it might be something else. Ramachandran, B.S. Ramachandran, very famous neuroscientist living very near to you (laughs) Um, in L.A., uh, says the right hemisphere is the devil's advocate. So what he's really getting at is that it's, it's seeing other possibilities all the time. And what's very important in creativity is not to collapse what, you're, what is coming into being too quickly into a conscious expression, because it's rich while it's doing this ramifying, growing, and you don't want to crystallize it before it's reached its fullness. It would be rather like pulling up a plant to examine the root system and make sure it's developing really well, but this is not going to succeed in improving the flourishing of the plant. So it, it, it's a very important point that this, these two kinds of uh, intelligence, um, one much more imaginative than the other, need to be kept apart for a lot of the creative process. The left hemisphere comes into play at a much later stage where you're making perhaps kind of more distantly critical decisions about whether this is really the right word here or not. Mm-hmm. And, and that gets into, too, um, the, the title of your, your earlier book, The Master and His Emissary, um, whereas uh, the, the right hemisphere is the master and the left is the emissary. Can you explain why, it, it, why you use that framework? Well, interestingly, since writing that book and in, uh, coming to write my more recent book, which came out in November last year, Um, the matter with things, I learned that all over the world there are myths such as the one I had heard of the master and his emissary. The master and his emissary story can be stated fairly simply. There is a wise spiritual master who looks after a community well so that it grows, but as it does, he realizes that he can't look after all the business of it. In fact, not only can he not, but he must not get involved in certain aspects, because if he did, he'd lose his overall view. So he appoints, effectively, a bureaucrat, a minister, his emissary, to go about doing his administrative business and to report back the outcomes. And this um, emissary, though bright, is just not bright enough. He doesn't know what it is he doesn't know. 
And so he thinks he knows everything. He assumes he knows more than the master, although he actually knows very much less. And he adopts the cloak of the master and the whole thing, the master, the emissary and the community uh, fall apart in ruins. So I discovered that this is actually also present in the 8th century Chinese uh, text, The Secret of the Golden Flower. It's also in the I Ching. It's also in the great epics of the uh, uh, Hindu Vedanta um, uh, mythology. It's also there, as it turns out, in the most extraordinary fashion, in a in a myth held by the Onondaga people, an Iroquois um, First Nation people in America, uh, which is so staggering that I, I tell it at some length at the beginning of part three of my new book. But th that image is obviously something that we've intuited. I mean, obviously these people didn't know how the brain functioned in its two hemispheres, but just by inspecting their own thought processes, they realize there's a part of them that is very wise and knows a very great deal, but is constantly being sort of interrupted and encroached on by a lesser faculty that thinks it knows it all. Yeah, there seems to be, and, and I wonder, there, there seems to be an almost a, a desperation for the right brain to, to tell the left brain what it knows. Is that, is that the case, you think? Like that the communication is almost one way? Um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about, last year we interviewed uh, James Pennebaker. I don't know if you're familiar with his work about expressive writing and the healing powers of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so James Pennebaker is just fascinating. He started um, way back in the early 80s um, at the University of Texas, I think. He um, gave undergraduates this expressive writing assignment where they would just write about their most traumatic event, and then the control group would write about something random. And um, he found that the people who wrote about a traumatic event um, had like, tangible, measurable results uh, months later. Um, they had better grades, they slept better, and they even had their blood work showed better, um, just healthier blood work. Um, and so I think more T cells, it was a T cell count. And so, um, right, right. yeah. And, and so there was this way that, that somehow, um, you know, getting to what you don't know, you know, but you don't know, you know, or, or what your right brain or your subconscious right. is trying to tell you is healing in some way. It allows you to sleep better at night and, and you're, you know, there's less visits. That's one of the things too, that were less visits to the, the health office, um, for colds and things mm. for the, for the group that mm. had, had written about their traumatic events. And so the idea that, that he, the groundwork for that is that, um, that it's that, that sense that the right brain knows this thing and wants you to come to terms with it, but you haven't yet in your left brain. And so it's, all, it's, it's sort of desperate to, to have that kind of connection. And then once it does, you can sort of heal and move past that traumatic event that you experienced. Um, and, and so that just that creates the sense that, that, the, that the right brain wants to tell the left brain, um, but the left brain won't mm. listen. Is that is that something that, yeah. that aligns with your your reasoning? Uh, absolutely, and at several levels. So first of all, um, at the electrophysiological level, the right hemisphere does communicate more and more quickly to the left hemisphere than the left hemisphere does to the right. Then there is the evidence from split brain patients that soon after the procedure in which the corpus callosum is surgically divided, so the hemispheres for a time are somewhat more distinct from one another, more independent, if you like. Um, during those periods, very often the right hand will show its impatience with something the left hand is doing. Uh, 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 sorry, the, the, the left the left hand of the right hemisphere is doing yeah so the, for example um the the person may get out with the right hand left hemisphere a cigarette and begin to light it up and the other left hand of the right hemisphere comes takes it and throws it across the room so don't do this you know so i mean not that the right hemisphere is punitive but don't forget it knows more than, <laughs> than the left hemisphere and is less bogged down by um routine than, than the left hemisphere in certain literal ways but I think the, the more important thing from your point of view is that the right hemisphere communicates through complex symbols, mm -hmm. images, narratives, myths. So the whole business of both art and indeed religious traditions, spiritual traditions, depend on myths and on symbols. And so, of course, does art all the time. It's, it's dealing with things that must remain at the symbolic level. If they become simply 
a coded version of something that can be stated explicitly. They've lost their artistic qualities. They've just become a, a book, um, like a manual that you could read. So it must always remain at this level where it has power over one emotionally. We talk about our gut feelings about things. Well, that is actually literally also part of what's going on. One's body is involved in the reaction to a poem. It, it affects your heart rate. It affects your blood pressure. It can make the hair on your neck stand up. It can bring tears to your eyes. Your musculoskeletal, um, your musculature it relaxes and, and tenses uh, in reaction to the movement of the poetry. And, you know, you have more nerves in your gut, more neurons than are in the brain of an intelligent animal like a dog. So your body is busy communicating with the brain about things that it understands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Emily Dixon says, um, you know, I, I know it'll, it's a poem if I feel like the top of my head has been physically taken off. And I've always thought mm -hmm. that that, mm -hmm. that feeling, which we all get reading a great poem, um, you know the goosebumps and the and the sort of chills and that that just that visceral feeling has something to do with mm. the the two parts of yourself um, coming into alignment about something for the first time that you were disaligned about. It feels almost like a, you know, the way like um, like a step leader starts a lightning strike, you know, and so there's like this connection and then the bolt of understanding and that that's that that feeling that we chase as artists, I think, not just poets, but in any art. Do, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yes, and also scientists and mathematicians, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have moments of insight. In fact, all great um, uh, discoveries in both maths and science seem to be accompanied by, first of all, a, a period of hard, dogged work, but then a letting go and relaxing and allowing that just to sink into the unconscious mind. And then it's so often described, almost inevitably described by great scientists and mathematicians, that it was just when they were busy doing something else, like one particular example is a mathematician who was putting his foot on the bus after going shopping. Suddenly, the answer to something he'd been working on for two weeks came. But this is the general story that these intuitions come, and they are that sense, the aha sense, is accompanied by activity in the right superior temporal, right superior temporal sulcus and gyrus, and in the right amygdala. So it is very much a right hemisphere mediated element, obviously in art, but also throughout human experience. And it involves being able to bring together um, shapes, images, and felt connections that if you look at them too closely will vanish mm -hmm. yeah, so and, and so once you've got them they're okay but if you try and do this process too early that's really the point i'm saying mm -hmm. then you lose it yeah. and, and how much I mean, so many scientific discoveries have come through dreams too i mean like the the structure of yeah. benzene was one thing that came in dream um watson and crick the double helix Apparently, yes um, yes. and, and I've heard that, um, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but I've heard that Thomas Edison, well, maybe it was, I think it was Thomas Edison would sleep with a, with a ball bearing in his hand over a metal pan and it's sitting in his desk. He That's let himself it. fall asleep. So he'd have a dream. And once he fell into a deep enough sleep to have the dream, he dropped the ball, wake himself up, and he'd remember the dream. And that's some of where some of the insights of his came from. And, and it feels like that's all just tied together. Like It feels like poetry and just art in general is the stuff of dreams. And, and dreams are trying to make this connection, too. Like the dream is, A dream is almost like the right mm -hmm. hemisphere trying to tell through symbols what the left hemisphere needs to know, um, which is also mm -hmm. what art is doing. So, so how are dreams, how do dreams function within this, uh, this, this model? Well, uh, there are differences of view about the exact neurophysiology of dreaming, and uh, but my own view, to cut a long story short, is that it is effectively when the right hemisphere is more active in communicating about what it knows, yes. And certainly um, Jung thought that uh, dreams uh, contain very important information about what was happening, what might happen in the future, etc. So there is a long history indeed of poets um, likening their, their insight to moments of vision in a dream. Uh, and, he, and in the Bible, too, prophecies are seen as coming in sort of dreams. So uh, that, that is a, a, a strong connection that we're, we've always made between this. I think the important thing is not necessarily whether you're actually dreaming or asleep or if you're awake, but it's the thing of 
importantly, not being in control. Mm -hmm. Now, the trouble is that the culture in which we live leads us to believe that we should be in control of things all the time. And if something's not in control, it's a danger. But this is the left hemisphere speaking. Don't forget, it's the one that's trying to get stuff, command stuff, to have control over things, to have power to do things. Uh, it's the spirit behind technology, um, not behind the best science, but it's what technology is, is the ability to do more, basically stuff. Um, and we need to be a bit careful. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I depend on technology for many of the things I do, but we need to be careful that we're using it wisely because otherwise what we're doing is putting machine guns into the hands of toddlers. But in any case, yeah, um, what can I say? I, 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 I agree with you. <laughs> um, and that, so that, that brings up the... the, the act of making, you know, the creative process itself. Um, and it, it seems to me that what poets, just, just hearing them speak about their process, what they're all trying to do is find a way to turn off the left brain or quiet the left brain so that the right brain can speak. Mm. So there's um, mm. this, this aspect of ritual to it for a lot of writers. They'll use the same kind of, yeah. like I have one of these black wing pen, pencils, which somebody gave me because that's the only thing they okay. can write poems with. Um, you know, a certain okay. time of day is the writing time of day, you know, they have to be in a certain mm -hmm. place or in a certain setting or in a certain mood. And there's sort of this, this ritual aspect to it, which helps maybe quiet the left brain. Um, and then there's the whole um, way that the architecture of formal poetry works, too, which, which always strikes me as a kind of way to focus mm -hmm. on the details of language so that, you, so that your focused attention is like distracted almost so that surprising things can come out. Like the, the poets who write formally, I'll say that they can't write um, free verse poems because they don't have the same creativity. It's like the, the process mm. of, um, mm. of focusing on the meter and the rhyme is what allows them the yeah. freedom to move within and make these surprising leaps and connections. So, so yes. um, is, that, is that something like how, how, yeah. Yeah, how does that work? How, does that, how do you go about shutting down the left brain so that the right brain can bring out art and poetry and, and those surprising understandings. Yeah, I mean, how to do it, I think probably depends um, from, you know, it changes with the person and some people have their rituals, as you say. Um, but what is definitely clear is that, as so often in life, a balance between freedom and constraint is very important and that actually some element of constraint actually liberates. Uh, Goethe said it is, it is the law that gives us freedom. And, and also, he said, in limitation, the master first declares himself. And it's well known that many poets were sort of, as it were, guided into their very best lines by the constraints of meter and rhyme. In fact, I think the, the lack of rhyme is, is the throwing away of one of the most powerful effects in poetry. Um, so, yeah, um, we need to be able to, to feel that. And often, I think, and it's certainly been my experience, I'm not much of a poet, but I have written in the past, is that poems come to you as sort of shapes or outlines to begin with. And occasionally there's a couple of words that seem to be kind of bringing themselves into focus somewhere in this mix. And it gradually kind of comes into being more like a, a picture coming into focus than a, a line of things that get added to one another. So there's a sense of the whole at the outset, and then it gets filled out, I suppose. How you do that, I don't really know. I mean, I, I spend most of my time not writing what is conventionally thought of as creatively. Mm -hmm. I hope it is creative in a way, but I don't, I don't really write poetry. <laughs> and what I found with that is that it's just a very, very, very hard thing to do. And some people say, you know, when I tell them I really sweat blood over my writing, they say, that really surprises me. It reads so easily and so well. And I say, yeah, that's because I sweated blood over it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how much of it is, is meditation? Um, because that, that's the thing that I keep coming back mm. to. I, I always say uh, that, that I think the best book of um, advice on writing is Zen in the Art of Archery. Have you read that? Uh, I've read the more famous book with a similar title, but I haven't read that one, actually, no. Um, yeah, so, so um, <laughs> it, it's just this, this instructions on how to, to do archery. Um, but, okay. Um, so let me, uh, let me, I don't, okay. 
Uh, so this is from Zen and the Art of Archery. The right art, so, we, so it's an instructor teaching uh, somebody how to do archery mm. and have the kind of calm and balance that it takes to actually hit the target. So he says, um, yeah. the right art is purposeless, aimless. The more obstinately, obstinately you try to learn how to shoot the arrow for the sake of hitting the goal, the less you will succeed in the one and the further the other will recede. What stands in your way is that you have a much too willful will. You think that what you do not yes. do yourself does not happen. And so it always strikes me is no. that the left, with its goal-oriented um, focus, mm. is that willful will. And what a creative person has to do is, to, is to turn down the voice of that willful will and let the spontaneity come out. Um, does, that, does that resonate yeah. with you? And, and, and that, it feels like that's meditation, though, too. Yeah. Like when we sit and meditate, what we're doing is turning off that yeah. voice in our head that's just always yabbering about one thing and letting us be in the moment and, and of the right brain, maybe. No, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, I, I was going to say that, you know, one of the ways in, in which we can practice uh, letting go of our controlling thoughts and controlling words and limiting ideas is through mindfulness meditation in which we are simply present. That is maximizing the openness of the right hemisphere and it should be distinguished from the idea of nothing happening <laughs> you're making nothing happening but in that space of active receptivity not passive receptivity but actively opening your ears as it were to attend not to put something there to attend to but exactly to get away from doing that and to try and contact whatever it is that is trying to get in touch with you because if you're able to preserve that open receptivity, you do find that there is much that it can be then communicating with you. Otherwise, the noisiness of your own thought processes would have drowned out. So yes, I do actually think that mindfulness meditation particularly is, is a very good tool, whether you want to write or not, but perhaps to help still what is called monkey mind, you know, the, the left hemisphere uh, jumping about, going from one concept to the next and thinking, yeah, I've got it, I've got it. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. So you, you want to s switch off from, from that. And, and the trouble is that most of our way of life in the modern world is geared to uh, distracting uh, elements that distract our attention. It's very hard for people simply to empty their mind of distracting thoughts and distracting mm -hmm. wishes and desires. So yes, uh, that business about the willful will, I would, you know, there is a sort of deep desire in the right hemisphere for attraction to certain goals, but that sort of willful conscious controlling will is the left hemisphere interfering and yes i mean golfers musicians everybody who practices an art or a skill knows that if you try too hard you choke mm. and you don't do well so it's there's a period though as i often say when a bit of willful practice is extremely important. If you're going to be a great pianist, it's very nice to be attracted towards the whole piece. That's the first thing that happens. That's the right hemisphere's openness to it and understanding of it. But then you have to start going, that passage at bar 18, I've got to keep practicing it and so on. And, and you understand the harmonic structure of the piece you're learning. But then when you actually go out there and perform, you've got to forget all of that or you'll do a terrible performance. But it's not that what you did was wasted. It's just that it must now sink into the realm of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And indeed, a philosopher I very much admire, A.N. Whitehead, Alfred North Whitehead, said that a civilization advances by the number of things that it can do unconsciously. Mm -hmm. and, and he meant the same about human beings. We become more and more efficient as we can do more and more without actually having consciously to strive to achieve it. Yeah, it's fascinating that you bring that up because I was uh, I wanted to talk about the the, the development over time of a, of poets and just artists in general um, because we do this other thing we have a rattle young poets anthology once a year which is um, poems written by children okay. age fifteen and younger and there's this fascinating right. thing that we found just reading the submissions that come in we get thousands of submissions every year we pick a few dozen um, for this anthology and and there's just so much creativity. In the early, you know, we've had poets as young as age three, and then up until around 12 or 13, there's just this sort of freedom 
And then around, mm -hmm. you know, 12 or 13, yep. the freedom yep. just collapses yep. into the self-consciousness. And then it feels like what, um, <laughs> yeah. like, like a poet across their life is trying to, to follow that model of learning a piece that you were talking about. Because cause we, we fall mm -hmm. in love with the creativity, but then we, we apply all mm -hmm. of the learning and the knowledge of writing and the skill. And then we have to get back to that child place at the end. And that's where it seems like a lot of people yeah. fall out. Um, Sharon Old says mm -hmm. that there's not a bad poet in the first grade. And, um, and, and that's just our experience. Like they're, they're, they're all just natural poets. Every one of us was a poet when we were young enough. You know, every, everybody wrote some, some lines and, and we learn to acquire language through nursery rhymes and things like that. And then eventually we fall out of it um, and we become self-conscious and, and, and lose that sort of connection to the right hemisphere's sense of magic, I guess you could say. Um, so how do you see, does, does something happen at that age, you know, just neurologically to, to explain that? Or is it socialization? Um, and, and, how, and how much about, about creativity is getting back to that childlike state of wonder? Yeah, I, I've seen just what you describe happen. And I think one does have to rediscover that sense of wonder. In fact, all one's life, one needs to try and recover a sense of awe and wonder which one had earlier in life and which are feeble uh, attempts to understand the world which we idolize and think are so clever drive out the more astute wisdom of the one who is simply awestruck mm -hmm. there are many poets that have written about this Wordsworth and Coleridge wrote about it uh, Rilke, the German poet, wrote about it, and um, it's a very, very important point. I, I sometimes distinguish between a kind of unknowing and ignorance. So ignorance is what you have before you know anything. Then you start knowing stuff, and finally you need to come out the other side of knowing with a kind of unknowing, which is worth all that knowing and more. You know? <laughs> and it's slightly like... The innocence of a saint is not the innocence of a child. You have to go through the experience of being, you know, a, an adult in the everyday world. And then, if you're lucky, be able to recover that very special innocence. So I think it's the, again, it's the uncontrolling, the undoing, the unknowing mind, which is all there in Zen. And really the wisdom of all this is, is already there for over a thousand years in, in the Zen literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's just the fascinating thing about your work is it, it provides an explanation, you know, biologically and neurologically for, for what people have been exploring in that tradition for so long. Um, um, so, so you're a lover of poetry. Um, and I love during the pandemic the, where you were mm. reading poems on your YouTube channel. Um, how, how do you conceive of the, the importance of poetry for society and, and throughout history, too? It, it always strikes me as poetry um, was almost the first tool we had because we had this long oral tradition that stretches back, you know, to the time of cave paintings 50,000 years ago. And that was the one way we could record yeah. our important stories was through the rhythms and repetitions of language to keep the story straight. And so it feels like we kind of co-evolved with poetry. Um, how do you how do you envision the space um, and importance of poetry within just culture and generally and into the human experience? I can't express how important I believe it to be. And in relation to what you just said, I was puzzled at school to learn that poetry came before prose. That Greek poetry was older than Greek prose, for example. And in The Master and His Emissary, in Chapter 3, I talk about the evolution of language out of the music of the human voice, the other expressive parts of language other than purely the dictionary and the syntax. Um, and I think that poetry is extremely important for conveying so many things that are diminished as soon as they're put in everyday prose, which is why I think it's a mistake for religious rituals to be turned into um, the most prosaic everyday language that you can find, because in doing so, you lose the poetic power of them. Mm -hmm. So I constantly go back to the ancient texts and the ancient translations into English that were made 
um, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, which are so powerful, made at a time in the English language was maximally expressive, I think. So, I yes, when we were all rather sh- hit amidships by the um, COVID pandemic, I, I just I felt that we were all rather cut off from one another. And what I felt was very important was to to communicate in powerful truths that were non-dogmatic, but that were experienced viscerally by people simply using language. And so I, 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 I read 365 poems over the year, one for each day. And I suppose I could have gone on, but I felt, felt there has to be a time to come to an end. Um, and I actually enjoyed it hugely. I, I, it took me back, you know, to a, 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 an era when I had much more... I was much more immersed, really, in, in, in poetry. I mean, I've always read it all my life, but, but it was wonderful to go back to these things and to just read them and feel them. And from a neurological point of view, what is special is that the same place that is so important for empathy, which is the right frontal cortex, is also where the important parts of poetry are understood, metaphor above all, mm-hmm. um, the, the implicit meaning of something in context. This is what poetry gives one. You know, I wrote early in life a book in my 20s called Against Criticism, which was published by Faber, and um, I think it sold 400 copies and then was unceremoniously remaindered. Um, <laughs> um, and, but in it, what I was trying to express was, you know, what is wrong with the process, the academic process of turning a poem into prose in order to, quote, understand what it means, um, taking phrases and expressions out of the context in which they stood and therefore rendering them utterly lifeless and losing the sense of the unique by turning it into the general and the abstract. No, it's unique and embodied. And, you know, so that was the theme of that book. But what I didn't know at that stage, but then later found out, is that all these things, the sense of uniqueness, the sense of embodiedness, the need for context, the understanding of metaphor, of implicit meaning, even the understanding of the, the, the myths and narratives of, of great prose works or drama, are all rooted essentially in the right hemisphere, either in the right frontal lobe or in some cases in the right temporal parietal region. Yeah. Um, can you say more about metaphor? Uh, we have um, something called the Neil Postman Award for Metaphor that we give every year for the best use of metaphor okay. in one of our mm. issues. And, and Neil Postman, because he was such a champion of metaphor, he said, um, I think mm. in uh, The End of Education, he says that um, uh, a metaphor is not an ornament, but an instrument of perception. And I always love that that sort of th- that idea that, that we learn, we understand the world. Like everything originally was a metaphor. I mean, even in a way, mm. like, even the concept, like a chair, originally was a metaphor, because mm. not all chairs look the same, mm. you know? And you have to sort of mm. abstract mm. into metaphor to even make a noun. And so, so the yes. whole world is sort of built yes. out of these metaphors that the right yes. brain has created, that the left brain now yes. uses. Um, and and yes. so, so can you just speak more about the importance of metaphor? Because the, the strange thing, that once, mm. <laughs> once we put this, this um, award together, and you look at just the metaphors... You actually notice how even in, you know, 300 poems that we publish every year, how mm. rare a great metaphor really is. Um, it's something that's, that doesn't yeah, come up yeah. fresh and original and, and, you know, that kind of inspiring mm. type metaphor where you're learning something. It's so hard to do yeah. and, and it's so rare even in poetry. Um, so can you just speak more about the importance of metaphor and, and what that means to you? Yes, indeed. As you say, our language is founded on metaphor. It's how connections are made between the world of experience and language. So even the word metaphor is from a a word meaning to carry something across physically. A gap, the implied gap between these two elements in one's mind and consciousness. And even the words we use to describe abstraction, like abstract itself, means dragged away. Um... You know, immaterial comes from a root meaning mother, actually, originally, then wood, and then wow. so on. Uh, uh, virtual comes from a root meaning the strength of a man. It, it, they're all very physical, actually, at bottom. And um, as the philosophers Lakoff and Johnson have beautifully illustrated in their books, Metaphors We Live By and uh, Philosophy in the Flesh, um, 
the, the, really we can't say anything without using metaphor and particularly science and philosophy are dependent on metaphors to be able to say anything at all. So uh, it's a complete mistake to think that we should somehow avoid metaphor. They're not little um, frills added on to the top of language. They are the bedrock of language out of which the rest grows. So um, I think this is uh, something we, we don't... Uh, uh, understand or honor enough and I think it's you know very important in not just poetry but in all aspects of life to be using the right metaphors and models one of the problems I feel with the way that not physics which is streets ahead of biology but where biology is still sort of you know in a doldrums of mechanical thinking in which it just likens everything to a machine it's a terrible metaphor actually um, and um, physics has gone long beyond that realizes that nothing is mechanical actually and that you need to be using as Niels Bohr said you need to be using the language of poetry to express the realities of physics. So we're not talking here about something that can be dispensed with or something that is nice and decorative. We're talking about something that is essential to meaning. And as you rightly say, um, often they've become rather cliched. And they, the, the, the um, uh, research into where metaphor is understood in the brain has been muddied by people putting together cliched metaphors mm. and fresh metaphors. Ah. Fresh metaphors were understood in the right hemisphere. Cliched metaphors have lost their metaphorical nature. We just take them literally, and they're understood in the left hemisphere. And it takes a shock to get that metaphorical meaning out again. And there's an English comedian um, who specializes in this, and I remember him, he's called Milton Jones, and I remember hearing him one day, he was saying, you know, towards the end of his life, Dad asked us to rub his back with lard, but after that, he went downhill really fast. <laughs> <laughs> and it, what he's done, and that's the right hemisphere, he, he suddenly vivified a completely dead metaphor, and that coming to life again, that electricity is in the, is in the right hemisphere, which also, incidentally, understands humour. Yeah. Can you say and these things are being driven out of our conversation at the moment. I mean, not ours right here, mm -hmm. but I mean, in the public sphere, people are afraid of and trying to stamp on humor. They're afraid of, you know, anything that leads away from a few um, dogmas which they have decided are the truth. Well, but I'm sorry, guys and gals, truth is not like that. Truth is, is not just a fixed thing that you think is, is right and is somewhere in a book. Yeah. We have to be talking to one another, honestly, openly, with humor, with kindness, with, with empathy. And that all is the right hemisphere yeah. stuff. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, can you say more about the, the connection between um, humor and, and creativity and art? Because there's a, there's a wonderful essay by Kay Ryan, one of the, a U.S. poet laureate from a few years ago. I think it's called The Ah and the Aha. Um, and, and she talks uh -huh. about the way in a yeah. poetry reading, you know, if you, you come across one of those sort of enlightening, that connection, that top of your head come off feeling, yeah. the audience kind of goes, ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she talks yeah, about the way yeah, that that's yeah. somehow related to laughter. Um, somehow it's a release yeah. like mm -hmm. that. I mean, I imagine it yes. as like the bridge between the two hemispheres being connected. And there's like a release of yes. like emotional energy that's been pent up because of that. Um, so how do you see yes. humor and, and art being connected? Well, um, I think obviously an awful lot of art doesn't need to be connected with humour and high art usually is not. But there is um, such good humorous art. Um, I, um, I, I love it and, and it's, it's also making the same sort of connections that poetry does. I, I'm... Um, you know, a friend of, of, of John Cleese, and I've said more than once to him, as far as I'm concerned, the really great comedians such as yourself are up there with the great poets because they, they bring these lightning insights from a double take on an expression or a thought. So they're constantly stimulating our minds in this, in this wonderful way. Um, so, yeah. And you know there are there are great poets that that are very funny. Um, 
and some, I've just forgotten the name of a poet who I know very well and read read a lot of during my. Who's the very very well known American poet Billy? Oh, Billy Collins, yeah. Mm-hmm. Billy, Collins. Billy Collins. Yeah. That's it. Billy Collins. I kept thinking Billy Connolly. No, that's not right. No, of course Billy Collins. I. I just love Billy Collins. I mean, I could have done a year of reading Billy Collins' poems. I I imagine he's written that many. But they're so clever and so funny. Um, Very rewarding indeed. Yeah. 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 Uh, What do you think, um, the poems that you read over that year um, that that resonated Mm. with you, what do you think elements, Mm. what did they have in common that that you were drawn toward? Because you, a lot of the stuff you were reading was um, more traditional poetry, rhyming and meter, but then you did, you do love Mm. Billy Collins as well. So, so what do they have in Mm. common, even though they're so different in the way they're, Mm. that they're constructed? Well, they just have to be good poems, uh, I say in a rather unhelpful way. Um, and an awful lot of good poems, as I see, are, you know, benefit from the constraints offered by meter and rhyme, if you can even call them constraints, because they just liberate the poetry into wonderful, you know... I mean, I think of so, so many poems, but the one that comes immediately to mind is a poem by Sir Walter Raleigh. I, I read quite a few of the poems of his, so from the 16th century, but, you know, as you came from the holy land of Walsingham, met you not with my true love by the way as you came. And then it goes on in this this ballad-like thing, and it sort of, you know, it, it comes with these wonderful lines at the end, but, you know, love is a durable fire from itself never turning, never old, never weak, never sick, never sick, never old, never tired, from itself never turning. And these really potent moments that even when you know them very well, it makes the sort of hair on on the back of your head stand up. Mm -hmm. You know, I know I'm in touch. It's the houseman test, you know, he said that you know it's poetry when you're shaving and you read it and the hairs stand out. (laughs) Uh, I I think that's a very good um, test. So, yeah, yeah, I, I... I, I like that, and but also you see, I do think that good humorous poems um, do the same thing. They, 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 although they make you laugh rather than kind of feel a sense of awe, um, they they make you contact something that gives you life. I mean, I think the great thing is that a poem communicates a little vital spark, and a world without poetry is a world without life. Yeah, yeah, I I completely agree, and then that brings up. I was we were kind of dancing on the topic of your new book, um, the matter with things. Um, about how mm. the the modern world has become too left focused. Um, can you? I mean, it's a fifteen hundred mm. page book, but can you sort of summarize yeah. your your argument there, the elevator pitch for that, and then? And I just want to know how <laughs> you think that that poetry can be the antidote to that, because that's that's the reason I'm doing what I'm mm. doing. Is I, I sort of have the same sense yeah. as you, and, and the reason yeah. why I sort of give myself permission to do this rather than some kind of scientific research is because I think this is what's missing um, in, in life. And so, so can you explain um, just what the, the thesis of, of your newest book is and then, and then how poetry relates to it? Mm. Yes. Well, um, just in case people are frightened by the idea of 1,500 pages, I should mention the last 200 <laughs> are the bibliography and index. But, um, yeah, I... I I started off writing a completely different book, actually, but anyway, which was really just a shorter version of The Master and His Emissary, and I soon decided that I had no interest in that at all. What I wanted to do was to pursue the philosophical implications of this fact that the two hemispheres reliably offer to us two consistent phenomenological versions of the world, which we we can recognise, and we know we're juggling them all the time. So... If that's the case, how do we decide what is true? Now, you know, I'm not saying there is one single truth. Of course not. But some things we have to assume are truer than others. Otherwise, there'd be no reason for doing or saying anything. We might as well just stay in bed for the rest of our lives. The only reason we do or say something is because we believe some things are truer than others. And if we're going to arrive at that, how do we do it? if there's two different versions of the world. So the first part of the book, effectively, I look at the various handles that our hemispheres offer on the world. I sometimes say portals. So through the quality of the attention they pay, through their ability to exercise perception, 
to their ability to think and make judgments wisely on the basis of what they attend to and perceive, their social and emotional intelligence, their cognitive intelligence, and their creativity, which is also part of how we come to understand anything as what it is. And I discovered that, in, to cut a very long story short, in every case, the right hemisphere is more reliable than the left. Mm -hmm. Now, that might sound, well, okay, I don't really care whether it's the right or the left, so what? Well, actually, so quite a lot. Because if the left hemisphere's art is simply apprehension, grabbing, but not comprehension, then we need to be able to recognize when we're being advised of what the right hemisphere sees and when we're being advised of what the left hemisphere sees. And they have a hallmark, they have an imprint, they have a stamp that we can recognize. And sometimes famous paradoxes in logic, which started with the, with the Greeks, of course, are based on the difference between the right hemisphere's take and the left hemisphere's take. And sometimes the right hemisphere is the one that is definitely right, but we can't explain quite why the other one is wrong. For example, Achilles and the tortoise. Achilles, you know, is challenged by the tortoise, a famously slow animal, and Achilles, the fastest man on earth, you know, to a race. And Achilles said, well, you know, mm, you're not going to win that one. And he says, no, 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 I can always, you'll never even be able to catch me up. So Achilles gives him a start. And the logic is, Achilles can never even reach the tortoise, never mind overtake him, because first he's got to get to where the tortoise starts from. But by that time, the tortoise has moved on, so now he's got to get to where the tortoise now is. But by then, the tortoise has moved on, and so on and so forth. So this is an infinite series, and apparently, according to the logic, you can never get there, and Achilles didn't overtake the tortoise. But excuse me, we know that he overtook the tortoise in a couple of strides. So although these things may look equally good, one of them is right, and the other one, importantly, is not. If you assume the other one you're going to go wrong so i think i've made a small contribution to philosophy because when you look through the history of philosophy often there are competing points of view mm -hmm. and people say well you know this school of philosophy said this but another said that you know and over time some people have gone this way some people have gone that way well i think for the very first time this is a bold claim but i think i can substantiate it philosophers can take a step at any rate towards being this is likely to be more reliable than that it's not just necessarily true and the other one false but it gives us a steer mm -hmm. that's the first part of the book the second part of the book i can talk about more simply it's really just saying so what paths given this equipment do we follow in pursuing truth mm -hmm. and i take these to be science reason intuition which we've talked about, and imagination. Yeah. And what I basically arrive at at the end of part two is that we need, if preferably all four of these to be exercised, at least three, but at the moment we most often use only one or two. Mm -hmm. And each, the best part of each of them, including science and reason, by the way, is offered by the right hemisphere, not the left. So that's consistent with part one. And actually, the findings of science in the end and of reason are not in conflict with those of imagination and intuition. Mm -hmm. And then part three, the final part of the book is, so when we use these paths to approach the universe and say what we find there, what do we find? So I look at things like time, space, matter, consciousness, and even things like values, purpose, um, the sense of the sacred, uh, which I think is a, a profound thing in consciousness. I don't think it's something we made up, but something we respond to, and there's a universal human um, a feeling, although you can kill it, you can disattend to it, and you can rubbish it, but there it is. Mm -hmm. It's important. Yeah, one of the things that, um, you know, having the, the world be taken over through science and technology by the left, the left brain's obsession with materialistic things i guess you could say mm, mm. is that um the left brain we, we haven't mentioned but the left brain lies you know i mean the left brain mm, if, mm, if you if it gets some information it's so mm, desperate to have a, a simple model that mm. can focus on with that three percent that it's looking at that it will just make up any story it wants exactly. to justify not having to change its model and so when we yeah. have um you know, when we have a world that's built around that we have end up with this like artificial world where th where lies become sort of everywhere and i think especially in politics you you feel that and and, and something's been going on in poetry um, i'm not sure in the uk if this is the case but poetry's been getting much more political um there are a lot of political poems mm -hmm. that are submissions mm -hmm. we have this mm -hmm. thing called poets respond 
uh, where every Sunday we publish a poem written that week about current events in the news. And just mm. six or seven or eight years ago, there was sort of a variety of things in, in over in the United States mm. anyway, um, with, with the rise of Trump and that the, the even more divisive politics. It ends up that, that the majority of poems are, um, that we receive are, are political. And, and they're clearly mm. the majority are written from the left brain perspective of like, I know the answer and this is the explanation. Mm. And I feel like when I'm reading mm. submissions, I'm just looking for, I'm listening for honesty and, and for that, that truth that's like deeper than what the left brain is like projecting in the story that it's trying to say. Um, so, so can you just speak to that? Like, th does the right brain lie mm. or does the right brain, is the right brain more honest than the left brain? It certainly is, and, and not just I have said that, but a number of important neuroscientists have made exactly that point. Um, its thinking is very simple, it tends to be rather tram-lined and rigid. It's according to dogmas and principles, whereas everything that we are talking about in that creative realm has nothing to do with dogmas and principles, but is alive to something very deep inside us. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't welcome a move towards politics in poetry myself. I'm not saying that n no poem ever written for a political reason could be a great poem. No, but but I'm just saying I don't think that's a, likely to be a very fruitful move. Mm -hmm. um, and the left hemisphere, uh, the term used in neurology is confabulates. It means it makes up a story to fit the little tiny bit it knows. Mm -hmm. So it knows only 3% of the story, but it makes up the rest so that it sounds... And it's not consciously lying, mm -hmm. but it is actually lying <laughs> and sticking to its lies in the face of people challenging it. Mm -hmm. And a very dramatic instance of this, which I can, I often do speak about, is it's, it's extraordinarily unshakable optimism that it knows best and it knows right and nothing to do with it is ever wrong. So it will literally deny a paralysis. So if, if after a right hemisphere stroke, a left arm or leg is paralyzed, the person may completely deny that there's anything wrong with the left side of their body at all, because after all, the left hemisphere that is now in full control knows everything, controls everything, and makes it all right, so that in the future it's just going to be fine. Now you hear plenty of people talking, oh, just a little bit more technology, and we'll we'll have sorted ourselves out. We'll produce a, you know, a wonderful world. But wait a minute. First of all, technology only makes us do stuff, and making do stuff is only as good as what we want to do. So until we've got more wisdom, <laughs> this is never going to help. As Einstein said, we can't get out of the mess we're in using the same thinking that got us into it in the first place. And I think that is something very, very important to remember when people use this left hemisphere style. And how do you recognize it? Well, you recognize it by its anger, because once again, the old story was the left hemisphere was unemotional, the right hemisphere was emotional. But actually it may be of interest to people that the most lateralized emotion in the brain is anger and it lateralizes to the left and that it's the right hemisphere that inhibits excesses, inappropriate excesses of emotion. Um, it's anger, it's self-righteousness, it's narcissism, it's I am right, you are wrong, I can point you to the text you should read. You mustn't read these other texts. Um, and it's, it's reliance on simple dogma and refusal to debate, refusal to hear another point of view, because that is already um, some kind of an outrage to it. Well, this is, this is the way a civilization breaks down really fast. Yeah, this yeah. is what totalitarian regimes have done. This is how Hitler came to power in Germany. And, you know, they burnt books in public. And Heine said in the early 19th century, and I'm sure Heine will be one of your favorite poets as he is mine, um, when they start by burning books, they end by burning people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, I mean, really, I mean, poetry is, or, or art in general, but poetry in particular is the antidote to, you know, what you point out in this book is the, the way we're going off the rails, because poetry is an avenue toward wisdom and into deeper and into con contradiction and the complexity of life and the, and the awe that we, we should be experiencing every day, but often don't. 
absolutely. And, and you know, I only have to go back to particularly Wordsworth, um, who I think is un, inexhaustibly deep. Um, I, I, and not just the famous short poems that are anthologized, but his really great works like The Prelude and The Ode on Im- Immortality and The, um, uh, the, the Tintin Abbey Ode and, and things like that. Um, I only have to go back to those to sort of feel my sort of pounded, flattened spirit from this onslaught of ignorance and 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 violence uh, to feel my my soul reviving again mm. it is it is very profound the effect that poetry can have it really does bring back to life it's restores it's it's almost a a tool of 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 the soul of the spirit well Wordsworth would have said exactly that not a tool he wouldn't have called it that and I don't really mean a tool because that makes it sound we only value it for a utilitarian um, outcome but what I mean it is it is the path the channel for the truth Mm -hmm. to come back into our lives and I, I just wanted to comment that you know I think truth and beauty and goodness these great values are not things that we invented I don't think they're human inventions. Mm-hmm. I think they're human discoveries, which is a quite different matter, that they're there and it's up to us to respond to them. And that what's more, our response to them brings them more into being in the universe. Mm-hmm. So we actually play a vital role, each one of us. We're not just passive observers. We are participants in the universe. And, you know, John Archibald Wheeler, physicist, said this is a participatory universe. We bring stuff into being. And I think we do. So how we attend to the world with what qualities of mind and with the view of which values makes an enormous difference to the world we're going to live in and do live in. Yeah, well, that, that's a wonderful place to end it on. I, I, as much as I would love to talk to you for, for hours, I can feel like we could go on with that topic alone. But thanks so much for, for generously offering us this one. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Ian. Uh, it, it was just uh, as good as I'd hoped. <laughs> no, thanks very much, Tim. And uh, if you ever uh, minded after this to um, invite me another time, I'd be delighted to. Oh, to, I would definitely uh, love that. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so okay. much, Ian. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah.